Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session uh, from Fitch Learning with regards to your CFA program exam uh, preparation. Just by way of introduction, uh, my name's Tom, Tom Gordon. I'm one of the uh, CFA program uh, financial trainers at Fitch Learning. So I hope you've had or maybe having a good day, depending on where, where in the world you are. Um, I just thought I'd just kind of come along, give you a short session um, just to kind of... Uh, remind you of the kind of looming examination just to kind of give you a few top tips with regards to the CFA program exam which is uh, what is it 16 days away now so um, I'm here to kind of talk around a little bit around I guess what what Fitch does as a, a training provider and also just kind of give you an awareness of uh, 10 key tips to think about as you lead up to the examination. Uh, I'm looking on the right hand side here because I also have the ability to kind of uh, also filter any questions that you may have as I kind of go through. So I try and multitask and keep a look on the right hand side just to see if I notice any, uh, any um, messages come through. So uh, first of all, like I said with the agenda, we'll just talk a little bit around I guess Fitch Learning, who we are, what we do, um, and then what we'll do is kind of talk around, first of all, just a little reminder, you should be pretty versed at the moment with regards to the exam formats in terms of what you should be expecting in terms of the structure on the exam day, and then what we'll do is get cracking with the kind of last minute top tips for kind of getting through the CFA program exam. So um, I try and keep this as concise as possible. I certainly feel these sort of sessions, of course, shouldn't go on for hours. Just kind of give you a few key tips and you can kind of uh, you know, dip in and out of this recording to kind of go through it if you wish. Okay, so first of all, a little bit about Fitch Learning. Okay, we are an accredited training provider by the um, CFA Institute. <clears throat> we provide, obviously, a lot of tuition towards kind of financial and also certain non-financial um, kind of related subject matter. Of course, training towards the CFA program exams kind of represents kind of a core foundation of our business. So you see there are lots of experience with regards to helping candidates through their CFA program studies. Um, my own background, I guess, you know, I've been with uh, Fitch Learning here for nearly 13 or 14 years. Um, being with uh, another training provider before coming to Fitch Learning. Um, but again, can attest to have been through all three levels and kind of talk around, you know, some of the experiences that I might have experienced with regards to my preparation, also the kind of exam experience to a certain extent, uh, and, and trying to relay some of that advice to you, right? So uh, you may wish to take some of that advice on board, but, you know, everyone's always going to be slightly different in terms of maybe what they feel they're going to um, do on the examination day itself. So also just to kind of bear in mind is that uh, you may um, not have used a, tra a training provider, so you might have studied on your own, you might be using the CFA curriculum books and you may be looking to get a little bit of a kind of a brush up as you get close to the examination. Then we do also have a few, I guess at this stage with sort of 16 days to go, kind of, um, I guess, some online options that you might find useful that might kind of facilitate maybe a little bit of question practice, maybe a little bit of kind of bite-sized tuition, but ultimately as well, kind of mock examination. So we'll talk around some of those, those options. Now that's going to center around our online platform. And we refer to it as the Fitch Learning Cognition platform, which ultimately is the kind of uh, personalized learning experience which will facilitate an adaptive process to your kind of studies to kind of make sure that you gain the proficiency required across the breadth of the level one CFA program exam. So that's important to make sure that you do get the question practice, but it's also getting the right areas kind of targeted to brush up as you get closer to the exam day itself. So we'll just talk through in just a bit some of the review packages that we have available. Um, but like I said, that does center around, <clears throat> excuse me, the Fitch Learning Cognition Portal. Um, you will find that if you, if you do access, let's say through the review package, then predominantly you're gonna be able to access the kind of multiple facilities found within the desktop environment of uh, Fitch Learning. So that will be access to, for example, sort of mock exams. We've got kind of strength and tab by being able to do things like study session tests. But also, you know, we know that obviously people are on the move, you're moving around. So of course, if you are traveling and you want to maybe download some videos or if you wanted to do some question practice, on your um, kind of uh, phones, I guess, then you can download the relevant cognition app from either the Android store 
or from the iOS store. So you will find also the kind of syncing of your portal across desktop versus the mobile app as well. Um, you get um, basically lots of guidance on kind of how to study for the remaining sort of 16 days. So the review tab is kind of geared towards you know, giving you a few pointers to what to expect in terms of things like the logistics on the exam day, but also there to kind of give you um, kind of key hints and tips with regards to maybe debrief of questions via kind of short videos. So all of that will be found on the Cognition portal. Like I said, at this stage, it's probably not so much the kind of classroom tuition side, given that there's, what, 16 days to the exam. So a lot of it's going to be based around, I guess, the online review kit that we do provide um, for you guys. Then on there, what you're going to find is a variety, like I mentioned before, of question tools. There's going to be workshops. You know, it's important sometimes to kind of do a set of questions, kind of debrief is as important as doing the questions themselves at this stage. And you'll find there's a lot of uh, useful videos on there sort of debriefing key topic areas like fixed income, equity, derivatives, and then using the kind of tutor videos to kind of debrief on that subject content. Of course, wouldn't be uh, an online portal if you didn't have access to um, significant availability of mock examinations. You'll find that that's going to be centered around what we call preparation. So kind of getting used to you know, advice from tutors on how to prepare in the kind of weeks leading up to the exam now, what to think about on the exam day itself. So there are some sort of small preparation advisory type videos. Of course, strengthening your knowledge across, for example, study session tests, the ability to um, build your own questions through a question bank so you can access nearly 4,000 questions and create your own sort of mini tests and mini mocks kind of covering specific areas that you want to kind of strengthen. And then also perfecting your exam technique for success through um, significant mock exams that you'll find on the review kit. Um, some people might say, well, okay, I'm, I feel as I'm kind of prepared anyway. Then of course, what you can do if you wanted to kind of get access to some additional mock exams, then there are some standalone mock, uh, mock exams that are available. Now, we'll provide those online, and I'm gonna mention this later on anyway, so what you really need to consider is to make sure that you do sit, you know, at least maybe one couple of mock exams under time conditions. And I don't mean kind of doing the block of 20 minutes, you know, the full three hours to kind of get used to the exam feel and kind of how you would approach doing a rigorous three hour exam from kind of aspects of you know, getting tired, but also, I guess, issues surrounding I guess is the, the breadth of the three hours that's required to get through on the exam day, and that kind of covers things like time pressure as well. Um, you, you will see down the bottom there, there's a little URL, which if you want to get some more detail with regards to some of the review options that we've got available, then feel free just to kind of pop along to that um, web address, and you can just see what review kit options are available if you find that useful. Now, that's a little bit about kind of who we are and what we can provide you with, I guess. Let's kind of now deal with, I guess, some of the issues that you might be thinking about as you lead up to the examination day. Now, it kind of sounds obvious, you know, I come in here and say, oh, by the way, did you know the CFA exam? And you've been studying it for four months. But, you know, for the years that I've been teaching the CFA program exams, it's amazing what you kind of come across on a day-to-day -day basis. But let's just kind of go back to square one, just to remind yourself, you know, are you aware of the structure of the examination that you're likely to experience on the examination day? Of course, two papers, morning and afternoon. You're going to have a total of six hours in total for both the papers. Of course, that represents three hours per paper. So, of course, we'll see later on the rigor of the exam means that, of course, that's going to be quite tiring. And again, trying to deal with the issues of fatigue, making sure you're getting good sleep as you lead up to the examination is also going to be key. It's not always what about, you know, it's not always what you know. It's also dealing with the issues surrounding the fact that are you kind of physically prepared for that demanding six hour paper. Um, 120 questions in the morning, 120 questions in the afternoon, all of a multiple choice variety, A, B or C. No negative marking, important because if you don't know an answer to a question, which is possible in the CFA exam, then as a minimum, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to just guess and throw in an answer. Do not leave a question unanswered because that's just crazy, right? There's no negative marking. Make sure that you do answer all questions. Each question is standalone. From that perspective, what we mean is you're not going to get a snowball effect whereby getting question one wrong is not going to affect your ability to answer questions two, three, and four, and so on. So they are kind of standalone questions, and we're looking at multiple choice, 120 questions per paper, three hours per paper, morning, 
and afternoon. Now, we'll talk more about the kind of examination experience, I guess, uh, a little bit in just a second. But uh, just kind of moving on from that, we're then going to go through, I guess, we kind of structured this into a number of kind of considerations, if you like, so the top tips in being successful for the examination day. These are considerations to kind of think about. The first one there says, know all the relevant functions of the official CFA program exam calculator. Now, you might be thinking, okay, great. Um, what is it? Ah, it's the Texas BA2+. I'm guessing that uh, you should be aware of that, given that the examination is 16 days away. There are other calculators that you can do for the examination. You'll find the majority of prep providers will teach towards the kind of classic Texas BA2 plus calculator. Um, and if you don't know, here we go. That's the one that we're talking about. That's the electronic version I've got up here. Little, the picture of it's a little bit outdated. It is a little bit more kind of uh, updated nowadays. But ultimately, the functions are exactly the same. Just aesthetically, sometimes looks a bit different. So just put an electronic version up there. Now, um, what I do find sometimes for people that may not have used a prep provider, uh, maybe they don't realize maybe some of the functions that the calculator can do. So, for example, you know, just looking back on there, if I look at, uh, for example, the button number two, you see it says there icon, that's its secondary function. Basically, the calculator has the ability to kind of switch between uh, what we call stated rates or what we call nominal rates versus effective annual rates. And you'll find that uh, sometimes that can help speed up uh, and it can be useful in areas like quantitative methods. Now in particular, I'll show you later on, is that I'm actually going to just throw in a little example to kind of say, well, sometimes these little tips come through through things like the review package where you can use the interest rate conversion, use that application of sort of nominal or stated rates and be able to convert them into effective annual rates for the purposes of looking at bonds. Uh, which are, let's say, fixed coupon bonds. And just working out some of the yield measures attached to fixed coupon bonds. We're going to go through this kind of concept of APR or annual percentage rate. Of course, there's the kind of classic time value of money buttons on the third row there. NIY, PV, payment, FE, kind of critical when it comes to the use of things like annuities. Um, data and stats, again, <clears throat> Um, statistical calculations like variance and standard deviation, well, the calculator will do standard deviation for it, uh, for you. You don't need to know the extensive formulae. If you can get the calculator to work out standard deviation, then of course you can kind of move to work out variance by just squaring the answer. So there's also the kind of statistical side, being able to do MPV and IRR type calculations. So you've got a cash flow function on the second row, net present value and internal rate return function, all kind of key for the exam, quantitative methods, areas like corporate finance. And just a little reminder, right, with the amortization really, um, that's actually quite useful in areas like the accounts because you'll look at, for example, uh, bond issuance, uh, and what you'll also be looking at is aspects of, for example, lease accounting. Whilst it's in the syllabus of any great detail, for the meanwhile, you've got there the ability to use the amortization function of the calculator to get access to accounting for bonds and leases quite quickly. Now, what we will provide you with here is a little URL again, another little website, you know, fitchexamprep.com forward slash and so on. You'll see in there we've kind of given you a small calculator guide to kind of show you some of those key calculator functions. Again, on the portal, we have collated all the relevant sections from the kind of teaching slides to kind of provide you with a series of videos that kind of show you all the key functions kind of amalgamated into one place through a library. So again, getting to know your calculator will be absolutely kind of critical for the exam. Um, I guess, um, you know, getting used to that would be the case of setting it up as well, just making sure you've got the right number of decimal places, you set the mathematical precedence on the calculator, for example. Again, it's really important you kind of get to grips with the calculator uh, and essentially how it works. Okay, what we're going to do, the next bit here, we're going to see number two, question practice and time allocation are crucial. Now, this is where I pretty much, for the rest of this session, keep going, mock exams, mock exams, mock exams. I can't stress how, over the next few weeks, the kind of mock exam, the question practice is going to be a really important part of your studies now, potentially at the expense 
of some of the topic areas that you didn't get to go through as much as you would have liked. You know, for the finer details of um, ISLM in economics, you might say, well, actually, I'm better off trying to understand what the hell's going on in accounts, you know. So from that perspective, of course, it's key to do the kind of question practice going back on previous material that you've um, seen maybe a while ago. And what better way to do that through the question practice? Because not only are you applying kind of what you've learnt, what you've forgotten, I guess, but it's also doing so in the kind of environment of question practice. And when you're doing that, what's important is that you may not have time to kind of sit down and do a full three-hour mock examination, but most certainly what you could do is sit down and do a block of questions. You might sit down and go through with some accounting questions, what, 15% in the exam. And remember, think about the kind of timings. You kind of say, well, okay, if you're in the exam, you could make a little note and say, right, off I go. I'm going to go through the accounting questions. You quickly put down how long you think it should take you to get through this and just keep a track on time. You know, do make sure that you get a good track of time so you don't put yourself in a situation where you start having to rush towards the end. Of course, you're looking at a sort of minute and a half per question. Don't get bogged down in sort of trap questions. So there will always be sometimes a show-stopping question. Now, you could sit there and go, oh, that's, that's difficult. Oh, what a nightmare. Oh, a nightmare. And then look at your watch and think, oh, I've just been saying nightmare for the last five minutes. Well, you know, push on, right? Because there will be easier questions potentially behind that you could easily miss out on if you're having to rush through them. So again, it's kind of a good kind of idea to kind of make sure you kind of keep to time and set that threshold, not too low, but you know, a good, good size that you see a question you think is going to take your time too long, then kind of put a circle around it, come back to it at the end. Um, always read the requirement first. Okay, give or take on that, I guess. I mean, if errors like ethics, is probably a good shout. You know, you'll probably find that you'll get like a scenario attached to ethics that can be quite descriptive questions. You might be better off looking at the ABC first of all, see what's going on in terms of the requirements of the question first of all, before you then go and take a look at the actual kind of uh, question itself. So you'll naturally, like I said, through your question practice and mock exams, kind of get used to the strategy. So then you're less likely to be surprised on the exam day if you've done kind of significant question practice anyway. Right, so what I thought I'd do, just kind of attach to this as well, <clears throat> and again, this is kind of exam technique, it's obviously knowing the material as well, we're okay, we're in fixed income here, fixed rate coupon bonds, looking at the way that we can kind of disclose their yields, but sometimes you kind of see formulae, uh, and you're thinking, okay, I remember that, yeah, this kind of concept of the annual percentage rate, the AEPR, and the AEPR in the context of the CFA syllabus is a rate which is kind of linked to uh, quantitative methods, which is a stated rate or what we know is a quoted rate. So that's an annualized rate, but it's just done on a simple basis. So if a semi-annual rate is 2%, if it's semi-annual 2%, then we can annualize just, for example, multiplying by 2. So the APR is kind of rough and ready, the stated, quoted, or nominal rate. Uh, and what we're going to find is that bonds will have coupon frequencies. They could be semi-annual. Uh, it could be monthly, maybe attached to certain, I don't know, asset-backed securities potentially. You know, the bonds don't always have standardized kind of coupon structures. So from that perspective, trying to make comparison can be quite difficult. So what we can do in the area of fixed income is that we could actually make two bonds comparable. We kind of see squeeze in the middle there as an equal sign. So that two bonds may have different APRs because of their different periodicities. They have different coupon frequencies. But actually, what they're doing with the formula there is taking the annual rates, dividing by the periodicity. So semi-annual would be two. If it's monthly, it would be divided by 12. Turning it down to a periodic rate, adding the one, and then raising to the power of the um, periodicity. So to consider the effect of compounding. And then what you're essentially ending up with somewhere close to the effective annual rate and what we're trying to do is say the, the correct way to look at bonds is on an effective annual rate basis make them comparable and they'll actually show different APRs but they're still economically the same and what we're going to try to do with this sort of question is saying well if we do have one bond and just using the kind of quantitative method terminology stated quoted or nominal rate if you look there it says a bond has a yield on a semi-annual bond yield basis of 3.404%, um, then in that case, that, that's the APR in the kind of context of the, um, let's say, the, the fixed income syllabus. And what we're going to try to do is to convert that into maybe an effective annual rate 
okay, which takes into account the effect of compounding, right? Because what we're then going to do is then go and try and show comparison. So what's going to be common to both bonds will be the effective annual rate to another bond, which is stated, right? This will be an APR, but that will fit into the equation on the right-hand side. But that will have a different periodicity, right? We're going to deal with, first of all, the fact that this is a semi-annual bond. And what we're going to deal with on, on the right-hand side here is convert to a monthly periodicity bond. So we're actually going to see, well, this is going to be monthly, and we'd like to know what's that stated rate. That's what we're going to fill in. Now, to do that, you're thinking, OK, I'm going to kind of try and use these formulae, the calculators against me. I'm making stupid mistakes. I'm getting a bit flustered. Well, I did say to you before, the calculator does have an interest rate conversion function. It's that button number two. So if I press second and then go number two, you see it's now saying on the screen NOM. NOM stands for nominal rate, which is your stated rate or what we call your quoted rate from kind of terminology from, fixed in, uh, from uh, quantitative methods. And with this question here, it says 3.404. Just going to peck this in with my pen here, so I hope I don't make a mistake. So 3.404%, that's the nominal rate. Store it into the calculator, top line, by pressing enter. And then top line, you've got the plus and the minus. You can kind of scroll through different menus of the calculator. You're going to go up one, so up one. C straight Y, compounding periods per year. We'll start off with the, um, the uh, red 3.404% uh, on the left-hand side for semi-annuals. We're going to set that to two for semi-annual, two semi-annual periods in a year. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is go up again. So it was two, enter, go up. It says E double F, and my calculator is kind of prompting me to compute. Top left-hand corner, compute. I've got 3.43297. Now, that three point, oh, that three point four three two nine seven percent is now the effective annual rate attached to that bond. Okay, so that's the uh, effective annual rate attached to the bond, and, and we're going to say between these two bonds, that's what's keeping these two bonds consistent. It's what's the equal sign in the middle is trying to represent. So, what we're now going to do is say, well, given that we're interest rate conversion function of the calculator. We could actually go back down, down arrow to C stroke Y. Now what we're going to do is keep the same effective annual rate or yield in the calculator. We're going to go to C stroke Y, change that to 12 to reflect the fact that this is now a monthly periodicity to periodicity bond. And then we're going to go, so 12 enter, we're going to go down again. And now we're going to go back to the nominal rate to say, well, we've kept the effective annual rate the same, 3.43297. Can you now recompute, you have to update the calculator, compute, and then it will go 3.3801%. Uh, you know it's an output to the calculator because on the top right hand corner is a little asterisk that now says that we're spitting out an answer because you had the old number first of all, you compute, you update, the asterisk comes on in the corner to say look this is now an output to the calculator. So we've got there 3.380% We've therefore got A. So I didn't really need to go near the formula at the top there from using this interest rate conversion to kind of say what's consistent to both bonds is the same effective annual rate. But now if we put in that on the left hand side of the equation and this bit on the right into the right hand side of the equation, then it would show some level of equality because they consistently both share the same effective annual rate. So it's kind of a good example there to kind of show you, you know, there is the application of the calculator. Sometimes it can kind of save you time in areas where it could take you maybe time to do it manually. Now, let's go to the third kind of tip here. It says make sure you know how a topic will be tested, okay? Um, link that to number four, might as well. Do not waste time on learning formally that will not be tested as a calculation. So I guess part of knowing how a topic will be tested knowing what formulae are important is kind of making sure that you can scan the learning outcome statements identified by the CF Institute because they'll give you very clear guidance. You know, this is uh, calculate, for example, a future value or calculate, for example, um, example, the standard deviation of a two asset portfolio. So you will naturally, by kind of observing the learning outcome statement, sometimes it's worth just a little flick through to kind of see some key formulae because what that will mean 
is that you then have an idea as to where you're required to know certain formulae or if certain formulae are being put down for more explanatory purposes. Now, it's not my job here, this stage, to kind of go, oh, let's go through every single formula here. But there are some absolute classics for the sake of the exam. And sometimes the kind of classic kind of idea of these, these, these formulae comes from the fact that they come up in maybe multiple areas of the syllabus. And if that's the case, and I guess it suggests it's potentially more likely that it could come up on the exam day. So the kind of classic standard deviation of a two-asset portfolio, you know, it's kind of W1, you know, asset one, you take in the square of the weight times the standard deviation of asset one squared, which is variance, you know, the weighting of asset two squared times the standard deviation of asset two squared, which of course is variance, plus the final term, which is two times the weighting of one, the weighting of two, times the standard deviation of asset one, times standard deviation of asset two, multiplied by correlation coefficient. Don't panic too much if you didn't remember that, but if we take the square root of all of that, that then gives us the standard deviation of a two asset portfolio. We kind of work in variance terms, take the square root, and off we go. And then making little links, okay, standard deviation of asset one times standard deviation of asset two actually links into one way to kind of back out the covariance, how two assets kind of move with one another. Areas like the capital asset pricing model, it's kind of classic. You expect the return on a stock, which is equal to the risk-free rate, plus you expect some premium of return of RM minus RF, but then that's made specific to the level of systematic risk you take on, which is beta. So of course, that then links into Portfolio management, when we talk about, for example, the, the concept of the security markets line. So there are multiple applications of these formulae. They all kind of fit in, but it's really important that you get to grips with these formulae. And what better way by doing more question practice? So naturally, you will forget formulae. But as you come across them, write them down in a book and then just keep plugging through and you'll get to grips with some of those key formulae. Usually the ones that tend to come up the most are probably the ones that you should remember. Um, number five, do not focus on your favorite topics at the expense of your weak ones. Yeah, uh, You kind of massage your ego uh, by going through those topic areas uh, that you're comfortable with and just kind of bury your head in the sand and don't worry about the ones that you don't. Now, I guess what that links to kind of link that, it says make sure you know the curriculum weightings and allocate your time accordingly, right? You, you go, okay, well, I love, I love alternative investments. I'm amazing. And you're thinking, oh, I just do alternative investments. It makes me feel good about myself. And then you're thinking, oh, back of your mind, 6% exam. It's not huge, is it? And then you're going, oh, I hate accounts. Don't worry about it. I bury my head in the sand. <laughs> There's no easy way out sometimes is that what you're trying to do at level one is to become the balanced delegate, you know, what you need to do is make sure that you do try to approach right, all topic areas as much as possible. And well, what am I going to say? I'm going to say, if you're hitting the mock exams, and of course the mocks are going to be structured according to these weightings, then naturally you'll get the breadth that's required. So please, please make sure that you do get the breadth. And if you are, you know, just doing questions off the hat, then try to make sure you get a fairly decent spread. Um, you know, using our, the, the cognition portal, for example, will naturally always keep a track of your proficiency and identify the areas where you're... So that's important to, of course, know the examiner and examination weights kind of gives you an indication of where you should be studying. Um, don't underestimate ethics, practice questions you can find. So the CFA curriculum, I always say that the CFA curriculum is a good portal call for ethics. You know, in particular, going through um, reading, I think, three it is, that's got uh, the application of the code and standards, shows you scenarios. Make sure you read those scenarios. It's really important to kind of get to grips with the way that the um, scenarios pan out in an application standards for what would or would not be a violation of the standards. And that's important because if you are a borderline delegate, of course, they will use the strength of your ethics score as a determining factor to determine whether or not you pass or fail the CFA program exam. So make sure that you are up to speed with ethics as much as possible, especially if you're a borderline delegate, because remember I've just said that they'll use your ethics score as a determining factor. <clears throat> right, last few in here. Um, last, uh, number eight here, do not overlook the CFA program curriculum books, even at this stage, aim to attempt all the questions. It's kind of a bit of give or take there, right? I think it's a bit extreme to say, okay, 
I'm now never going to sleep between now and the exam. But you may find that if you are looking for extra source of questions, a lot of people don't realise that the CF Institute curriculum books that you get access to um, electronically will always have kind of questions scattered in amongst the readings, for example, in the blue boxes. Uh, and you'll also find questions at the end of the reading, especially with the ethics that I just mentioned there before. There's a nice set of ethics questions at the back of the reading there that are definitely worth having a, a dip into some of those if you've managed to exhaust significant question practice. Um, but what I would say is that shouldn't necessarily be at the expense of sort of mock examinations. You know, mocks will be important to kind of get the breadth. You know, if you're kind of into pick to pieces, parts of the syllabus um, curriculum books, that could be a little bit more kind of cumbersome and time consuming than a bit of give or take. You might want to dip into the curriculum to have a go at a few questions. But like I said, that shouldn't really be at the expense of mock exams themselves. Um, the examination itself, right, so I'm not going to say anything that would go against what your exam ticket says. So you, you should receive your exam tickets from the CF Institute directly. Of course, what am I going to say? Just make sure you read it and make sure you read what they say that you can and what you can't do, right? So, you know, what's prescribed to be able to take into the examination, what you can, what you can't do. There's a little URL there again, a bit small, but it says CF Institute there. You can go and look at the policies with respect to the exam. Make sure you read them, okay? And therefore, you're not going to be surprised. So don't get yourself in a sticky position um, by not following the, uh, obviously, the, 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 the system properly, okay? So make sure you take a look at the policies of the CF Institute. The last one on here says keep your energy levels up during the final few days. Okay, for me it's been a long day at work, for example. It's half past five. I've been going all day teaching myself and I'm thinking this is like a six hour exam, so it's rigorous, right? So what you need to make sure is that you get the required amount of sleep. You know, don't just kind of study, 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 although you're naturally you know, ramp up your studies as you get close to the examination, try to as much as possible, make sure you still keep up on your sleep make sure you eat properly and you know on the night before the exam don't stay up till sort of four o'clock in the morning okay if, if you don't know on on the evening before the examination you're never going to know it relax you know chill out a little bit go for a walk get some fresh air okay so it's important as well to kind of keep the brain kind of ticking over you know that's going to require you to get the required rest and don't just completely burn yourself out by not sleeping in the week leading up to the examination. So that's just a few tips to kind of consider, of course, okay? Um, some of those you might take on board, right? Things you may already know. Um, like I said before, is that if you do need to get any further detail with regards to maybe some of the revision tools that are available between now uh, and the examination day, then feel free to kind of take the relevant contact that you'll see on the slide there. Um, I'll hang around to see if there's any questions, but other than that, guys, thanks for taking the time to kind of listen, listen to this session. Hope you found some of the tips useful. Other than that, guys, good luck for the examination, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, no worries. I'll take a look on um, Facebook or whatever. <clears throat>